Okay, it's after nine o'clock. Let's go ahead and get started. Welcome Cisco cohort four to this Tarrant County, Tarrant County College South Campus presentation of the Cisco Networking Academy curriculum entitled INSA Enterprise Networking Security and Automation. This is the capstone course in the CCCNA course. And by the time you guys finish this eight week course, we'll have completely covered along with the preceding courses, every single objective that's on the CCNA examination, the CCNA test. You can take it pro, uh, pro view metric or whatever it's called and get the, get the, uh, get your CCNA certification. Also, if you get above, a, I think a 75 points on the final exam in this eight week course, you'll get a big super fat discount voucher for like two thirds off the cost of that examination. Okay, up on the screen, I've got the schedule for today. We're gonna cover the first and second death by PowerPoint slideshows covering OSPF, Open Shortest Path First, which is a dynamic writing protocol. And you see, this is from the big document called, is my mouse active, my mouse floating here? I don't even know. ICR, instructor course requirement, instructor class requirement, that's the educationist term somebody came up with who has a doctor's degree in math education or something like that, but they wouldn't, couldn't, teach algebra to sixth graders if you held a gun to their head. Uh, most normal people would call this a syllabus. So let me go ahead and jump over to the, let's see, I'm gonna stop sharing this. I'm gonna start sharing this tab right here for, I think it's the announcements. And let's see if that pops up correctly here on the little monitor screen. Okay, so when you log on to my TCC Blackboard and then you click this particular course, you get this particular uh, student view of uh, the announce announcements always shows up at first on the screen. My mouse is, oh good, my mouse is working now. And this is the little copy that I uh, emailed you guys out earlier. Uh, my grades is a, uh, is this is a Blackboard is really freaky about grades, pay no attention to these numbers, but this shows that, um, we're going to be doing one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five labs. These last two labs are not going to be done. They'll be instructor demo. We don't have to do those. We have five labs in this particular course. Um, so 50 points in your score, 50%, half of your score in this course comes from completing these five labs, these first five labs listed here. The other 50 points will come from completing the, there's four or five uh, module examinations. Uh, unless the, uh, they used to have a separate chapter examination when we had 11 chapters, but now we have like 17 or 18 modules. So they have four or five module exams. And those module exams added together plus your final exam will be the 50 points for your written work. Uh, and uh, I do drop the lowest lab so you can safely not complete one of the five labs and it won't hurt you grade any. Okay, oh dear, that shouldn't be there. Um, Oh, wait a minute, this is supposed to be student view. Student view, let's get student view here. Okay, there we go. So here's the announcements. There's the my grades. Uh, of course, evaluation is a link that's a optional web advisor link. It's a student satisfaction survey. Uh, when we met in person on campus, they'd come and chase me out of the classroom near the end of the course and have somebody, uh, how you guys can create this anonymous survey and I can't see anybody's name or anything like that. Now, there is another, Student Satisfaction Survey called the Course Feedback Form on the Cisco Networking Academy site that you must take before you could take the final exam. And that's also anonymous and I can't see anybody's individual stuff. So guys, this is your one big chance to comment on my choice of math. So, okay, we're in the midst right now, the Black, Blackboard Collaborate Ultra. This is a Zoom-like thing that we meet electronically in a conference call with. Uh, the syllabus, we just saw that earlier. Uh, if you click on the syllabus, the ICR, you'll see all the list of the requirements for the courses, like uh, uh, the 50% for uh, the labs and the 50% for the written exams. And it'll show the day-to-day -day class schedule. Today, we're going to cover the first two modules on open uh, shortest path first. Okay, course presentations and material is all the death by PowerPoints. Oh, I forgot to tell the guys yesterday about this. I'm teaching two Cisco classes, guys. I'm teaching this uh, advanced course, this capstone course, and I'm teaching an earlier, uh, more fundamental course on Mondays and Wednesdays, which you guys got Tuesdays and Thursdays. So this is a, a, a Vivian Smith is our, in high school, you would have called her the guidance counselor. Uh, we give them a fancy educationist name. She's a student success specialist. And she knows everything about, uh, if you're, this is your first year in college, FYIC, first year in college, she's got some tips for you. 
So that's a little short PowerPoint presentation. And uh, if you want to look at that on your own time, or um, you can always call Vivian and uh, her phone number is in the slideshow and she can give you help about planning your, uh, you know, uh, career technical education type stuff you want if you want to get into IT. And most people that take my courses are wanting to get into IT. Here's the two modules we're going to cover today. Module one and module two cover OSPF. Now the labs that we're going to do are, here's actually the five labs. One, two, three, four, five. These are the five labs that are required for the course and you can safely do not one. If you can do just four of them completely, you're still going to get your full 50 points for the lab participation stuff. Now there's a couple of labs below that about uh, they're, they're optional, they're not required. Um, how to use the TerraTerm program to like save a router configuration file to the Windows clipboard and how to use a, a, a USB drive to copy stuff from a router or a switch and to use a TFTP program to back up and restore startup configuration and running configuration files. Now I also have some study guides here, which are, uh, there's some stuff that's been ch changed and taken out of the CCNA. They took about 25% of it out about two years ago. Uh, these are my study guides though that will cover some of the stuff that's in here, like frame relay. Frame relay is no longer required, but that's just some extra stuff in there. Okay, now let's jump over to, let me see, I'm gonna stop sharing this tab and I'm gonna go to the Cisco Networking Academy tab and to that I've got to go to here, I've got to go back to here, I've got to share a tab and I've got to share the tab that Cisco Networking Academy and let's just take a brief glance at this. Uh, the new course experience, if you haven't taken a course in the past, eight weeks in Cisco, you, you notice that the, their LMS, their online LMS used to be Canvas, now it's Moodle. It looks a little bit different. So let's look at our course. This is the course, um, uh, Enterprise Networking Security and Automation. That's our course. So I'll launch the course. Oh, he's gonna make me log in again. Oh, isn't this cute? Okay, oh good. So to see the e free ebook, Cisco has been giving away the free Network Academy has been giving away the free ebook for over 20 years now. So you, you click on, oh, course content, modules one and two, and that will open up. Okay, thank you, Chrome. That will open up the uh, pages of the ebook and you can go through and, and read the ebook kind of in that sense. Now, let me see. Oh, it didn't pop up on your screen. I got to share another, share another tab. Okay, it pops up on the other screen. I'm not going to do this here. This is taking... Uh, this is this is a uh, too convoluted. So we're going to cover one and two, and this is the examination. When you click on this, you'll get a screen where you can take the assessment. So let's see. There's one, two, three, four, five module exams. They're going to cover the 14 actual modules that we have in this particular course. Uh, this course feedback form is the student satisfaction survey that I mentioned. That Cisco does have a business rule or business requirement uh, that you uh, complete this course feedback form before you can go in and take the final exam. And you'll notice on the final exam, it says not available until you've taken the course feedback form. Now, this course also has a cute little CCNA certification practice exam. Hold on, check attendance. Give us one second. Okay, I've got four people pressing here and someone said something that um, they can't see something on my monitor, second monitor here. I'm seeing uh, the screenshot we're showing of the Cisco Network Academy login for a typical test student in this particular course. Uh, can everybody else, anybody else not be able to see this? Are you be able to, are you hearing the, our, our, my audio? Are you seeing my video okay? Okay. So now I'm going to uh, stop sharing this. Let's see, let's stop sharing this. Let's go back to this. And um, okay, so I've shown the my TCC Blackboard. I've shown a little bit of Cisco Network and Academy. And now it's time to actually go and start the PowerPoint presentation. Let me see. So uh, other people can see, okay. So Mr. Lang, I'm not sure about it. You're probably trying logging out and logging back in again, as the guy on IT crowd says, as if we turned it off a little good. Okay, now we're gonna go and we're gonna share.
and start with the big OSPF stuff. So I'm going to share my files and we're going to go to the first one and we're going to share that. And there. Now, so slide on the screen, module one, single area OSPF2 concepts. So we're going to talk about open shortest path first, which is a uh, routing protocol, a dynamic routing protocol. Up to this point, we haven't done any dynamic routing protocols. We did some static routing in the last eight week course. We did some static routing and pointed to uh, a network that was uh, one hop away from this router. And we told it how to get out the exit interface and go to that particular router. And the disadvantages of static routing is it doesn't automatically adapt to changing networks. It has very high security because you absolutely control what you're doing. So most of the time within a company, we're going to use some sort of dynamic routing protocol like OSPF. That's what Terran County College uses for their network is OSPF. And then we're going to use a single de de uh, default static route to point back to the home office or to point back to our uh, internet service provider. So what we're going to do is look at how OSPF works, basic features. Um, there are some packet types in OSPF that are used to propagate information, like how to find their nearby, nearby routers and how to uh, send routing tables to each other. And then we'll look at the operation itself and how we, how we configure it. Okay, features and characteristics. A link state routing protocol. The, now OSPF is an interior routing protocol that's used within a company. It's not like an exterior routing protocol, like border gateway protocol, BGP, like what ISPs would use to link to each other, or big customers that had one link to AT&T and one link to Verizon and wanted to balance their traffic. Um, we used to teach at CCNA, we used to teach something called RIP, routing information protocol, a very simple basic routing protocol that's been around for 40 years. Um, it was a, a, a distance vector routing protocol that sort of had a hazy, vague, neighborly view of its network. But OSPF is more like, it's like having a GPS in your car. You can see exactly what the routes are. And uh, it doesn't matter if you're a delivery driver in Dallas and driving to Denton to make a delivery, and you're a delivery driver at Fort Worth and you're making the delivery to Denton, you both will see on your GPS maps the proper way to get there. So from Dallas, you take I-35E to Denton. From Fort Worth, you take I-35W to Denton. So OSPF has a method of of mapping out like a GPS, the entire topology, the roadmap of the entire network, and every router has a complete view, not this hazy view that distance vector routing protocols like RIP and EIGRP have. So that way it can form a rock hard, absolutely certain, predeterministic route from every point to every other point in the network. It says it has faster convergence, which means that if a change occurs, you can map and a remap and readapt to that change in topology pretty quickly, and it scales up to much larger network implementations. Okay, so link state routing protocol uses the concept of areas. This is one of the things that makes the scalability thing work. We're gonna build a very simple, um, we're gonna build in CCNA, we're gonna build a very simple single area OSPF network. Now, if you go to your CCMP advanced routing concepts, they talk about multi-area OSPF networks. For example, Tarrant County College uh, may be the district office would be area zero and the south campus would be area one and the northeast campus would be area two. And we can break it into areas to make it more scalable and more manageable. This cuts down on the update traffic between all the different kinds of campuses and reduces it to one particular area. So a link is an interface on a router. So our routers have OG00, G01, our interfaces on our 29, uh, uh, 1941 routers we have in the physical lab at the campus. Um, uh, a network segment that connects two routers or a stub network. So if I take an ethernet cable and plug it between G00 of router R1 and G00 of router R2, I will get a link between those two routers. That's a complete little separate little broadcast network. Now on the routers that we will be using for the uh, packet tracer, uh, some of the labs are written assuming the newer numbering scheme that the newer Cisco routers use, and they may, for example, number their Ethernet ports G0 slash 0 slash 0 or G0 slash 0 slash 1. But you can always use my favorite command when you step on the router, type show IP interface brief or show prop for short protocol, and that'll show you what I call the interface port numbering scheme for that unfamiliar router that you're not. This is your first time on it. You can see how he numbers all the ports. Because if you type interface G000 and the router is only G00, it'll give you an error. You got to put in the right number of slashes. 
information about the state of a link is known as a link state. So for example, if I do a shutdown on that ethernet port, that link is down. If I do a no shutdown and I apply an IP address to it, that link comes up and up. And this link state information is one of the things that each router sends out to all of its neighboring routers so they can figure out what the roadmap is and how fast each link is. So we're just gonna look at basic single area OSPF implementation. Uh, if you're hungry for the multiple multi-area OSPF, uh, that's in CCMP material. Okay, we're rolling good. We're micros hot, good, good. So components of OSPF. Um, any routing protocol has to have some way of sending route information to other routers that are running the same router protocol. So for example, the old RIP protocol would broadcast this entire routing table to its neighbor every 30 seconds over and over and over and over again. And that helps the other routers all build up a knowledge of what the network mapping is like and how to reach and be able to ping any other point in the network. So routers that are running OSPF have to go through a process of exchanging some little link state packets with each other so they can discover their other OSPF neighbors that they're supposed to share routing information with. And these five types of packets is what the first type is called a hello packet. The hello packet is a special type of packet that each OSPF router sends out to look for neighbors. So if you configure a router to be an OSPF router, he'll start sending out hello packets saying, hi, I'm an OSPF router and this is my identity. And he listens for hello packets coming from his neighboring routers. And this neighboring router, he'll hear a packet from this neighbor router that says, hello, I'm also an OSPF router and this is my identity. Let's get together and form a, a, a neighborship, a neighborhood relationship. Once they've established a hello relationship with all the other routers and all the routers that are OSPF routers know about each other, they're gonna go through a process using these description databases and link state updates and acknowledgements to share their routing information they have in their own routing tables, all their link states with all the other routers. And after this flurry of information, flooding all this information back and forth to all the other routers takes place, we're gonna have in the, be in the happy state of convergence, which is defined in networking as a state where there is consistent routing information in each routing table, and no matter where I ping from any point to any other point in the network, the ping should work. And these hellos and link states will continue on an ongoing basis in case the network changes. So if a phone line goes down, a data line goes down, all the routers can know about it very quickly and try to maybe discover an alternate route to get there. Okay, inside the routing, uh, now remember I told you guys that routers are like computers. They have a CPU, they have RAM, they have an operating system. It's iOS operating system instead of the Windows operating system. So there are some database tables that are in the router iOS that keeps track of certain things. There's a table called the adjacency neighbor table. It has the list of the adjacencies, the adjacency database. So all the, this hello packets, that's how they discover their neighbors. They send a hello packet so their neighbors can hear them. Then they take and process the hello packets they hear from their neighbor and they establish an adjacency or a neighbor, neighborship or a neighborhood relationship with all the routers they're in direct communication with. So if I type the command show IP OSPF neighbor at the privilege exec mode, I'll see a list of all my neighbors. The link state database is a topology table. It's the information, this is the roadmap. These, the topology table is the roadmap or GPS of this network, this area network of OSPF. And so all of the routers within a particular area have the identical roadmap, just like the delivery driver in Fort Worth and the delivery driver in Dallas, they have the same GPS. They have the same map scope for Tarrant County and Dallas County and Denton County. They just located themselves on the map and they moved to their destination position. They both started at different locations, but they have the same map. So all the routers have the same topology table. They have the same map of all these connections between the different OSPF routers in this particular area. Um, then using a special algorithm, thank you Al Gore for inventing networking, uh, called the Dijkstra algorithm. Dijkstra was a brilliant computer scientist from Denmark or something like that who, uh, who taught at uh, University of Texas at Austin. And he came up with this Dijkstra algorithm, which is how the shortest path is determined between wherever you are and wherever the thing you're trying to ping or connect to is located with. So this is distilled into the forwarding database and in the routers, we simply call that the routing table. He type show IP route 
and you can see the routing table for that particular router. And if your network is listed in the routing table, your router knows how to get there. If your network is not listed in the routing table, you don't know how to get there. He's going to drop it. So the router is going to build the topology table. He's going to take this link state table and he's going to run the shortest path first algorithm through it. And it's going to be kind of similar when we looked at spanning tree protocol. Spanning tree protocol determines the lowest cost to the root bridge using cost. So OSPF does exactly the same thing, except he's at layer three at the network layer instead of layer two at the data link layer. OSPF is going to figure the shortest path to every possible destination. And he's going to distill those results and put them into the forwarding database, which turns into the routing table when we look at the router. This process takes a few seconds when you first turn the routers on. So here's the steps that are completed when you turn on a router. You turn on two routers and you enter the commands, router OSPF1, we'll see those commands in a little bit, to where they can discover the other routers. So as soon as the routers are activated, uh, the routers are going to look for their neighbors. They're going to send out hello packets and look for their neighbors. And once they find and establish an adjacency with their neighbors, then the two neighbors or three neighbors, however many there are, are going to exchange their link state advertisements with each other. They're going to share their routing table with the other routers. RIP did the same thing. Remember, RIP just sent his entire raw routing table to his neighbors every 30 seconds over and over again. But the OSPF is a little more discreet about this. So he sends the link state advertisements. And then each router will do the number three. They'll build their link state database. This is the master GPS or maps co of the entire OSPF area that however many of these routers are located in. We're just going to be using two routers in our labs. Then the, uh, the Dijkstra algorithm is calculated. The shortest path first algorithm is calculated. And this determines the best path to every other possible single point in the entire network that you could ping from every other possible single point. And the results are put into the routing table. And now when the evening router receives a packet destined for any particular network, he knows just how to route it in the most efficient, fastest way possible. So single area OSPF, this is what we're going to do in, in our particular curriculum. We're going to do single area OSPF and CCNA. Multi-area OSPF is really a topic for CCMP. We're just going to look at it briefly here as a conceptual 90,000 feet thing. But we're going to get down on the, on the tarmac here. We're on the runway with the single area. So this is a thing that makes OSPF more scalable and more efficient. We can divide a more complex network into multiple areas. So we'll see that slide in the next slide in just a second. So what we're going to do is single area OSPF. All the routers are going to be in one area, in two or three routers connected in one particular area. And they're all going to become aware of each other and share their routing tables, their topology tables with each other. In multi-area OSPF, we're going to have a, 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 a all different areas, and we have to have a backbone area called area zero. But we're going to do single area. But just, 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 just to the, for a glance here, here's a multi-area OSPF. So area zero might be, oh, the uh, Trinity River campus, our district. Area one, maybe that's South Campus. South Campus was the first campus, so we're number one. We're area one. And everybody's a comedian in networking, so we always have to have an Area 51, you know, because of the flying saucers and all, the, and all that idiocy stuff. Um, so all multi-area networks must start out with an Area 0, and then we tack on as many additional areas as we want to here. So this means the routing tables in each one of the individual areas are smaller, and anything we can do to reduce the size of the routing table on the router is going to increase its performance. You know, the routing tables in the back end on the internet, they have about, oh, 750,000 routes in them. So your little $1,000 branch office router ain't going to cut it. He's going to just drop dead. For, to do that 750,000 routes at ISP, you have to have a big million-dollar router, like a Cisco 7500 router. So we do everything we can to reduce the size of routing tables on our little branch office routers. We do summarization. Um, uh, we uh, summarize networks between areas. Uh, anything we can do to reduce the number of lines in the routing table. The Cisco engineers, software engineers, have already done everything they can with that indented parent and child route stuff to try to make the lookups a little quicker. Second big advantage is reduced link state update overhead. So if there's a change in area 51, that red X, that link has gone down. 
So all those routers are going to have to recalculate using the new updated. It's like each router sends out a little jigsaw puzzle piece of his corner of the network. And each router assembles the whole jigsaw puzzle and solves it. And then each router has the complete grub map or map score of the entire network. In this case, Area 51 is the entire single network, single area. And then they have to go through the shortest path first algorithm, the dictionary algorithm, and recalculate the best path everywhere. In this case, there's a disconnect now between the router at 3 o'clock and 6 o'clock. They've got to form a, a go with a reverse method and find another way of getting here. So that instability that's in Area 51, it only affects Area 51, and the guys in Area 0 and Area 1 don't even hear about it. And they still have connectivity. So that minimizes processing and memory requirements of our individual routers. Uh, reduce frequency of shortest path first calculations. So this means that in the case of Area 51, you have to do the recalculation. All those four routers, five routers in Area 51 have to do the recalculation. The routers in Area 0 and 1 didn't have to do any recalculation. They, they were uh, relieved of that burden. Okay, now I'm going to mention OSPF version 3. OSPF version 2 is for IP version 4, and currently in CCNA, we're only going to be configuring routing protocol OSPF for version 2, for IP version 4. There's going to be no requirement. There used to be, but they removed it, and that's the CCMP topic. Uh, configuring uh, IPv6 networks with OSPF, um, that's a concept thing now. So, but the special version of OSPF that handles IP version 6 calls OSPF. Uh, Version three. Hang loose. I'm going to check for any new attendees. Okay, we're good. We're good. So, um, OSPF version three is the same exact functionality as OSPF version two for IP version four, but it's for the IPv6 packets. So these days we're 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 supposed to be migrating away from IP version four, which is a legacy protocol. It has only has a limited number of network addresses, only has about 4 billion addresses. And we're supposed to migrate towards IP version 6, which has, you know, essentially trillions and quadrillions and quintillions. And so far as we're concerned, an unlimited number of addresses. So many companies today are, they're running what we call dual stack. So they're running IP, they're running IP version 4 for all their legacy stuff. And then they're, as they get new stuff, they may have it running IP version 6. And eventually we're supposed to completely get rid of IP version 4 and go completely to IP version 6. But we've been doing IP version 6 for over 20 years now, and IP version 4 shows no sign yet of really fading away. So that's why we're still going to do IP version 4 first, and then look at some IP version 6 later in some topics. Let's look at these packet structures. OK, we're not going to see the video. Sorry, no video. Um, Here's the here's the types. You can look at the video yourself on your own time if you want to by going into the curriculum on the six of the network and academy. You can even click on the index thing and unclick everything and click videos and it'll pull up all the videos for you. Okay, the hello packet, type one packet, hello packet. This is what the routers first send out when you tell them to start being an OSPF router. They're looking for their neighbors. Discover neighbors and build adjacencies, neighborhood ships, neighbor relationships with their neighbors. Uh, the second type of packet is a database description. This is what the, pack, the, the, the OSPF router is going to send out some generalized information about its routing table to his office neighbors in this area. If a receiving router wants more specific information about a specific network, he can send a request back to that first router saying, please send me more accurate, more detailed information about a specific link. I need to know more about it. And the link state update is the answer to the request. If a three request is sent out, a four update is sent back. And similar to the TCP sync, sync act, act, which acknowledges each and every segment when we have a TCP transmission of data, there's an acknowledgment, link state acknowledgment, which acknowledges the other packet types. Now, hello packets are not acknowledged because they're sent out every 15 or 20 seconds by default. But all the other ones get acknowledged because they want to make sure their, their routing table updates are accurate. So link state updates are used to send routing updates. There's 11 different types of link state updates. So here's some types listed here. Uh, this is getting, kind of getting beyond the scope of CCNA, but um, uh, these are the different types, depending on whether it's a multi-access network or a point-to-point -point network or so forth. So the link state um, hello packet 
it's the one that's sent out to discover other neighbors. Now they have to agree on things, certain things to become neighbors. They have to agree on the network area number, and we're gonna always be area zero. You have to have area zero, so all our single area OSPF labs will be area zero. You have to say area zero. They have to both be in the same area. They have to be in the same subnet. So in other words, their network address and their subnet mask has to match. They should be able to ping each other. And in multi-access networks like Ethernet, or previously we talked about Frame Relay, which is a multi-access network, but Frame Relay is gone now. Uh, multi-access networks like Ethernet, you could plug in. I could plug four routers and plug them into a hub or a switch, and they'd all be able to hear each other. So um, in an in a programming uh, scheme, some lines of code were put in to re reduce the number of peer-to-peer -peer connections if there's lots of routers. What we're going to do is we're going to take one particular router and we're going to elect them to be the designated router. And we're going to elect another router to be the backup designated router. <clears throat> and all the updates will be sent to that master router, that designated router. He's the, he's the king of the hill. And then he'll send out the updates to the others. So there's one centralized point of administration for storing all the uh, routing table updates and then it's broadcast out or multicasted out to all the others. Now, if it's just a point to point link, they don't need to designate a designated router or backup designated router. So the old serial links, they, they wouldn't have to do that. But if you have more than two routers on Ethernet, um, this reduces the traffic and it's done automatically. You don't have to turn it on, it just does it. Let's look at OSPF operation. Okay. When I connect two routers together, and do a no shutdown on their Ethernet ports and configure them to be for appropriate IP addresses, they're going to start sending hello packets. Okay, the router, uh, first router on the left is going to send out his hello packet and he hasn't heard anything back. He's going to send a hello packets. And as soon as he receives a hello packet from his neighbor, he has a unique router ID. His neighbor has another unique router ID that's different. They're going to go to the, init, to the init, init state, the initiation state. And as soon as he hears that uh, router ID that's not his from a, another router, he's gonna go to two-way state between those two routers. So once we've got this two-way state, we've discovered all our neighbors. We've discovered all our directly connected neighbors. It's like Cisco discovery protocol, that's be directly connected neighbors. So at this point, when we reach the two-way state, we can go to the state where if it's a multi-access network, we need to determine the designated router and the backup designated router so we can determine who the boss and who the assistant boss is. And then we're gonna to go to a state called the EX start state. And in the EX start state, <clears throat> we're gonna to go to a state called the exchange state where we actually send our routing table information to each other. So if I need additional information, I'm gonna to go to that loading state and ask for the additional link state updates and link state acknowledgements and requests. And once all the routing table and topology information is in sync between all the routers in this entire area, we're gonna be at the full state. And when we're in the full state, that means all the routers databases are the same. They all have the same roadmap. They all have the same map scope. Then they can take that information and distill it and put it in the routing table, show IP route. And you should be able to ping from any point in the network to any point in the network. This process of flooding all this information out takes a few seconds. So typically when you do this, you may wait, it may take, it may take a moment before you can uh, see your uh, other router information. Okay, we're fully synchronized and the routing tables are consistent with each other. Okay, so let's look at this hello thing. It determined if there's another OSPF router neighbor on the link, each router is gonna send a hello packet that contains something called his router ID. We're gonna talk in a minute about how he determines his router ID, but that's a unique 32-bit IP lock address. He's gonna send it all out the interfaces on the router that have been enabled to be used with OSPF. And it's sent out to a special, it's a multicast address. Remember we had, uh, we had uh, unicast and multicast and broadcast. A broadcast was like an ARP request or a DHCP request. Broadcast it everybody because we need to be able to server to hear us. A multicast is like a, a, a kinder and gentler method. So a multicast is sent out and it's only listened to by, for example, the multicast address 224.0.0.5 is only used by OSPF routers when they're looking for neighbors. Only OSPF2 
OSPF version two, IP version four routers will listen to those packets and pay any attention to them. So this router ID is a 32-bit number. It looks kind of like an IP address. As a matter of fact, he's going to use one of the IP addresses on the router, or you can type in a number you want him to use instead. Then whenever a router receives a, a hello packet with a router ID that's not his in his list, he'll attempt to establish a relationship with that initiating router. So all the routers in the area that are directly connected to each other will take a few seconds, learn their neighbors, learn their directly connected neighbors. So they're going to be in the down state, and then they'll go to the init state when they hear hello. Then they'll go to the two-way state when they send hello back, and both routers are aware of each other. And then in the last state, in the fourth state, we're going to elect the designated router and the backup designated router in a multi-access network when there's more than two of them uh, so that they can uh, act, act one as master and one as slave in this uh, process of exchanging the topology tables with each other. Okay, now RIP sends this routing table to his neighbors every 30 seconds over and over and over again, even if nothing has ever changed. When something has changed, everybody knows within 30 seconds. But it's a RIP sends this routing table to his neighbors in the form of a broadcaster and multicast. Takes up a lot of network traffic every 30 seconds. So OSPF does this all this flurry of activity at the beginning, but then it quiets right down. The only thing that's exchanged is these hello packets. They're very compact, lightweight packets. They don't take up a lot of network bandwidth. However, if a change happens, triggered update, the change will be sent out immediately. They won't wait. Otherwise, every 30 minutes or so, there's a, it's called a paranoid update. Every 30 minutes or so, the routers will act as if they just were connected and make sure, exchange all their links to information with each other once more, just to make sure that nothing new happened and it snuck on everyone and they didn't hear it or something. So that keeps the network traffic down and more network traffic uh, capacity, the network uh, 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 bandwidth is available for your business traffic. So here's, here's the problem with a multi-access network. Here we've got one, two, three, four, five routers that are connected to an Ethernet switch. And the problem is, as the numbers go up, you it goes up in like a square root relationship. Or So if I have five routers, I have 10 adjacencies. If I didn't use this master router, designated router, backup designated router mechanism, there'd be 10 peer-to-peer -peer connections where they're sharing all their link state updates with all the other routers. So this can become excessive amount of flooding traffic when they first start to set themselves up between each other. So by using a designated router instead, uh, uh, only the traffic is sent to the designated router, and he only sends it out to the other routers, and that reduces this flooding traffic, improves the efficiency of the network. This is automatically taking place by OSPF whenever there are, are multi-access networks. So instead of flooding the traffic, we're going to uh, elect a designated router. He's the central distribution point. Think of them like in spanning tree protocol, it was the root bridge, the central reference point to the network, the most powerful switch in your network. And everything was calculated as the cost. In other words, what's the uh, bandwidth between the root bridge and every other point in the network. So the designated router acts like a root bridge. It's a central reference point. It acts as a central distribution point. If I hear a change in my little router, I send it to the designated router. And he, in turn, multicasts it out to all the other guys. So the designated router is so important a job that we must elect a backup designated router. And all the other routers become others, DR others or druthers. A druther is simply a router. It's not the designated router. It's not the backup designated router. Oh, okay, great. Okay, let's stop this and we'll go to the second set of slides already. All right, we're doing good here. All right, this is a longer presentation on actual configuration. We're going to see how to configure OSPF. We're going to configure single area. We don't have to do any multi-access network. Uh, we don't have to do any multi-area. Uh, uh, multi-access means th two or more routers connected together to an Ethernet uh, switch. Uh, multi-area is more than one OSPF area, but we're not have to do any multi-area. We're going to do single area. So we'll look at how to set up, modify single area OSPF. Let's look at this problem about default route propagation. Remember I said there's the big picture in networking any company. One, we're going to choose a dynamic routing protocol within the company. Maybe OSPF. 
maybe EIGRP, EIGRP maybe RIP. Um, and then we're going to set up a dynamic, a, a static default route back to the home office or back to our internet service provider. So our little branch office routers that only cost $1,000, they would be swamped by 750,000 routes on the backbone of the internet. You need a million dollar router for that. Well, we're going to connect to our ISP and our ISP is going to have the million dollar router that we're essentially leasing for a monthly fee to get access to their processing power and their tools. And then we'll look at the verification of a OSPF itself with some show commands. Let's look at this concept of router ID. So here we have three routers connected together in a triangle. The addresses have been figured out. There is no static routing or dynamic routing configured on any of the routers. So what's going to be in the routing table for each of these routers, R1, 2, and 3, is only their directly connected networks. R1 on the bottom left is only going to know about those three subnets. R3 on the right is only going to know about his three subnets. Uh, R2, the one at the top, he's got four subnets. Uh, so R2 is our, is our backbone gateway router that connects back to the internet service that this particular company is using. So let's look at how we configure the router to start speaking OSPF in the first place. We're going to go to the global configuration mode on a pencil here. We go. We're going to go to the global configuration mode and enter the command router OSPF and a number. Now this number can be any 16-bit number. I always use one because it's easy to type. Um, it can doesn't have to be the same number on all the different routers, but for consistency's sake, I always use the same number. It's not like EIGRP where you have to say router EIGRP one or they won't talk to each other. The number that matters is the area zero, which is used in a different statement we haven't quite gotten to yet. So I'm gonna type router OSPF1, or in this case, router OSPF10. Doesn't matter any number, but we have to say router OSPF and make up some number between one and 65,535 and put it in there and they don't have to match. Yeah, nothing confusing about that, right? It's a process ID, it's not an area ID. So let's look at this concept of router IDs. It's a 32-bit value, it looks like a network address. It's used to uniquely identify any particular OSPF router, and they all have to have unique values that no conflict. Two routers can't have the same number. So all OSPF packets include the router ID of the originating router. Now we're going to figure out how do we, how do we figure this router ID, because there's about four different ways of doing it. So every router requires a router ID to be part of the OSPF domain. Now, I can define it myself manually. If I don't bother to do so, the router will automatically assign it. And this is used so that the router can do this synchronization of OSPF databases and determine who is going to be the designated router. Because in order to determine this designated router, you remember when we had spanning tree protocol, which bridge became the root bridge? Generally speaking, if you didn't change any other lines to the to default, the one with the lowest MAC address became the root bridge. But well, what if the switch that happened to have the lowest MAC address is a crummy $500 access layer switch, and you want your $50,000, you know, uh, uh, cord switch to be the root bridge? You have to go in there and you have to put in the priority command and change that. So with OSPF, we can either let it choose on its own, or if we want to specifically pick one particular router to be the designated router, we can do that. So if I don't do anything at all, whichever router has the highest router ID is going to be like the designated router. And let's see how he determines that. Okay, so if I go and configure the router ID explicitly, I'm going to say router ID 1.1.1.1 on the first router, and I'll say router ID 2.2.2.2 on the second router. Okay, STP was lowest MAC address. Router ID is highest IP address. So the router that I configure with the higher address, slightly higher address, 2.2.2.2, he will become the designated router because he has the highest router ID. If I don't perform that command, it drops to, pencil still on, if I don't do this, it goes to here. Do we have any loopback ports configured on the router? If any loopback ports are configured on the router, the highest loopback port on that router will become the router ID for that particular router. This was the method we used to use oh, about 10 or 15 years ago. This was the preferred method. They hadn't put in the router ID command yet. Use that as the router ID. 
the reason loopback ports were used is that if it's a physical port, like an Ethernet port, and it's connected to, a, say, a, a leased data phone line, and the phone line goes down, and the port goes down, it can no longer, it's not active anywhere. So physical ports are not to be trusted. I can unplug the wire. Someone can actually type shutdown on it. Loopback ports are not physical. They can't go down because they're always up and up. So loopback ports are much more stable. So if you don't configure the router ID, which is the now the preferred best method, you could configure a loopback port on that router and the highest loopback port number you configured, if you configured more than one on that particular router, that would become the router ID. It would use that as a router ID. Okay, so what if I didn't do either one of those two things? Uh, that's not good practice. I should do one of those two things. Preferably the top, at least the one in the middle. So if I don't do any one of those two things, the router ID becomes the highest active configured IP address on the physical ports that are in the up and up state on the router. If it's down because there's a line unplugged or a phone line went down, it's not considered. Someone forgot to threaten the shutdown, it's not considered. So this is not so stable. But he's got to have some way of doing it. If you don't do the first two, he's going to pick the highest IP address. So the router is now configured and determined what his router ID is. And it'll be unique between all the routers in the network. So let's do the loopback interface as their router ID. Instead of relying on the physical interface, this was the preferred method 15 years ago. We're going to go to the global configuration mode, and we're going to use the loopback interface. The loopback interface on the routers and switches is like that 127.0.0.1 on your desktop machine. You can always ping it. It's not physical. It's not real. Even if you have a computer with no internet connection or no ethernet adapter, you can still ping 127.0.0.1. So on Cisco routers and switches, you can create a loopback board. And in this case, he's given the address 1.1.1.1, and it's a host address because the subnet mask is 32 slash 32. And if I, whatever I configure the physical ports on this router, no longer matters because I've configured a loopback port. Notice you do not have to tap no shutdown on a loopback port. He's born alive and up and up. I can shut him down later if I want to. But when you create him, he's, 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 he's like the, the tribbles on Star Trek. They're born pregnant. Okay, he's born up and up, ready to go. I could use the router ID command. Now, this is the preferredly, in the past 10 years or so, this is the preferred method. This is considered best practice. So remember when we went to and first typed that line, router OSPF1, router OSPF10, the prompt changed to config-router. That's the first time we've seen that prompt here in this course. And then we typed the command router-id 1.1.1.1. And that configures the router ID for that particular one. And you didn't have to maybe accidentally advertise a 1.1.1.1 host address to the rest of the network and take up an extra line near the routing tables. This is the preferred method of establishing your router ID. Of course, you have to be careful. Don't put the second router 1111, use a different number. If you get two of them, they're going to get a conflict and they're going to figure it out and they're going to bitch at you about it. Okay, so his suggestion was, oh, router 1, use 1.1.1. Router 2, 2.2.2.2. Router 3, 3.3.3. Router 3. Any method you'd like would work. Now, I can change a router ID if I want to. Uh, so if I decide I don't want it to be 10.10.1.1 anymore, I want it to be 1.1.1.1, .1 I can change it, but I have to, to kind of reboot the OSPF program. I have to use the command clear IP OSPF processes, and that will restart the OSPF process and with the new number in it now. They have to go through reestablishing the adjacencies with all the neighbors because they have a new router ID now. And the router ID is the core identity to which all these routers know each other by. So you can change it. You can go to court and change your name. Sure, big problem, but you can do it. Okay, let's look at point-to-point -point networks. I configured the routing protocol to be on. I said router OSPF1. And the prompt changed to config-router. And now I want to specify all the network links that are on this particular router that I wish to participate in the OSPF process. In other words, um, I want to send and receive updates, and I want to be able to have connectivity with those networks to all the other networks in, in my network company topology. So we're going to use the command network and put in some network address. And oh my goodness, the wildcard mask. We haven't talked about wildcard masks yet. A wildcard mask is a mirror image of a subnet mask. So if my network was uh, 192.168.1.0, and 255.255.255.0 was the subnet mask. 
the mirror image of that is 0 .0 .0 0 0.0.0.255. Then you specify area 0. We're going to do all area 0 here. If you were doing CCMP and multi-area networks, you could do area 1, 2, and 3. Fortunately, in this course, it's only single area OSPF. OK, here's a little bit more about the wildcard mask. Typically, the inverse, the mirror image of the subnet mask. So when I configured that interface, I said interface G00, IP address 192.168.1.1, and press the enter key. So here's an example of how to convert back and forth between subnet masks and wildcard masks. You simply subtract them from the purple 255.255.255.255. You subtract that and you come up with the wildcard mask. Um, so, and this, oh, this chart is wrong. Uh, the wildcard mask, the subnet mask is 255.255.255.0. That green is wrong. The green is also wrong for the second one. But it works perfectly, and that's why you end up with our most common subnet mask in the world is 255.255.255.0. So our most common wildcard mask is 0 .0 .0 0.0.0.255. So here's an example of um, a router has three different networks on its three different interfaces. R1 had three different interfaces. And one of them was a slash 24, 255.255.255.0. .255 so that mirror imaged out to 0 .0 .0 0.0.0.255. One of them was a 255.255.255.252, which is a uh, address saving way, a slash 32 lap network that becomes 0 .0 .0 0.0.0.3. .0 .0 .0 .0 .0 .0 .0 .0 some iOSs will allow you to enter the actual subnet mask. And then when you do a show run, he will have gussied it up for you. It's kind of like Microsoft tries to gussy up. Microsoft Internet Explorer tries to gussy up web code that he thinks is no good. That's why some different web browsers will look, when you look at the same web page, it'll look slightly different on different web browsers. So as an alternative, I can use the quad zero method. Just use, use it for the routing process. Um, I don't have to calculate the wildcard ma wild mask calculation. You still have to say area zero. Now, here's my Gonzo secret insider tip of the day. If you want to go ahead and use each and every interface that's on a router that you're using OSPF on, and you don't want to type three lines and figure wildcard masks, just say network 0.0.0.0 space 0.0.0.0 space area space 0. And you remember when we did our default static routes? What was our default static route? IP route 0.0.0.0 space 0.0.0.0. What do those two quad zeros mean? That's the wild card in networking. In DOS and Windows, if I type delete star dot star, that's the wild card. Star dot star erases all the files, doesn't matter how they spell. So in networking, IP networking, 0, .0, .0, 0.0.0.0 is our wildcard mask. So when I say network 0.0.0.0, .0 that means any network. I don't care what the number is, all of them. The second 0.0.0.0, .0 I don't care what the subnet mask or wildcard mask is, all of them. And then area 0, you've captured all of your networks, no matter how many you have on that network. Now, that won't work when you want to exclude one of the interfaces. In the lab we're going to do on Thursday, they have you exclude one of the loopback ports. They'll have you do a network statement. You can't use that trick. But normally you want all of them connected. That's my secret little way of doing that. There is another method of configuring it on the interface itself, this, which is an offshoot of the IP version 6 step that we don't have to do anymore. So we can go interface G00, IP OSPF 10 area 0. And in this case, He's configured the gigabit 001 right here. And he's configured the loopback port to uh, all be uh, within the area. And they'll tell you this in the lab. They'll give you both methods. Now, passive interfaces. Let's think about that Ethernet port on R1 that went out to some users' workstations, some employee workstations. <clears throat> no more routers along that path. However, he's still sending out hello packets. If you attached a router to there, he would want to know about it. You're never going to attach a router to this network. It's a room full of employees running PCs in a call center or something. So we're wasting a lot of bandwidth sending out these hello packets and link state updates to a network that never needs to listen to it. It's just 
host PCs, no more routers. It, it uh, consumes resources. Everybody on the, on, the, uh, on the network must listen to these link state updates and decide whether they need to, they, they're gonna discard them because they're not routers. And it's additional security risk because people can run Wireshark and see what's running. So there's a method of, the, of, of, of configuring a passive interface where I can't just leave it out of the network statement. If I just don't put that network in the network statement, they'll never hear any updates, but they won't be connected. They won't be communicating with the other networks because they won't be in the routing table sent to the other routers. So you can use a passive interface scheme to do this. And what you're going to do is um, go to the router OSPF prompt. That says config pattern. And let passive interface loop back to zero. Or maybe in the case of the Ethernet port that went out to the call center, 100 PCs in the call center, you don't want them to hear all this extra traffic, you can say passive interface gigabit zero slash zero slash one. And that way it's still the loop back port zero or the Ethernet port is still advertised out to all of your OSPF routers. They can still hear them and communicate with them, but we won't waste bandwidth on that particular wire. Then we can type show IP protocols, and he'll tell us in this case, oh, you have passivated, you have keyest this loopback is zero, and there's not so much traffic on it anymore, and you're saving processing power. You're making the network more efficient. Okay, by default. Cisco routers will elect a designated router and a backup designated router on all Ethernet connections, even if there's only a one point-to-point -point leak. You can type show IP OSPF interface. It doesn't really need it because there's only two of them on here. But they went ahead and did it by default. So he went to router R1, he typed the command show IP OSPF interface gig zero slash zero slash zero. And I like this particular command because it shows you the actual router ID of the designated router in orange there toward the bottom, and the backup designated router, 2.2.2.2 and 1.1.1.1. Uh, there's another command, show IP OSPF neighbor, which only shows you if the neighbor is the backup designated router, designated router. It doesn't tell you about yourself. So this one, I like it because it tells you if you happen to be the designated router or the backup designated router, you can see which one you are. Broadcast type. Broadcast multi-access network. You can notice the broadcast multi-access network. So what we can do to reduce this traffic is we can say interface gig zero zero and say IP OSPF network. This is a point to point network. There is no need to elect a designated router and a backup designated router. And now when we type show IP OSPF interface gig zero zero zero, we see it's just a plain, more simple point to point network. Like in the old days when we had zero ports over T1 lines between home office and the remote office. It was a simple point to point network. Uh, these days, zero ports aren't in common use anymore because people have gone to Ethernet uh, handoff technologies like multi protocol label servers or, or Gigaman technology or stuff like that. That's what we use between our campuses. We have 10 gig, it looks like a 10 gig Ethernet cable between the campuses to us. It's really handled by the phone company using their Gigaman technology. So we can use loopback ports if we want to say, loopback ports are handy in a lab where you want to say, ping a server, but you don't want to go and attach a virtual uh, uh, a VMware a VM machine and configure it. You can just set up, I just want to go ping it. So I'll just turn on a loopback port on, the, on that router that it would attach to. So we're going to make those a slash 32 route. In other words, 255.255.255.255, a single possible IP address for that particular, just like a real machine only has one IP address. Or I could simulate a real local area network. I could configure this a point-to-point -point network and advertise the full network. And they're going to have you put in a couple of loopback ports in the labs. OK, multi-access networks. Multi-access networks are ones in which, in this case, we have four routers attached to a common Ethernet switch. And they all can hear each other. Uh, Ethernet. It's a multi-access network because all Ethernet frames heard are heard by everybody in the network. So in this case, we need to have one router controlling the distribution of link state updates. That's the designated router. Now I can let, remember we talked about this earlier, I can simply let the router accidentally having the highest IP address gets the designated router, or I can control it myself. Just like when we did STP, I can let it be an action of the MAC address, or it can be a purpose of the administrator by the administrator using the priority command. 
So in OSBF, we can use the, uh, the router ID command and choose a value that's higher than any other value of router ID and, and ensure that that particular router becomes the designated router and the next chosen one becomes the backup designated router. So in multi-access networks, like we just saw, there's going to be a DR and BDR elected. Uh, whether we want to or not, whether we do anything or not, there's going to be a DR and BDR. If we want to control which one is DR and BDR, we'll do that with our router ID values. So the BDR is elected in case the designated router fails. This is such a crucial function that if the designated router fails to perform its duties for more than one second, the BDR will perform a palace coup and jump in there and take over and become the designated router. He will promote himself to the designated router. All of the routers that are neither a DR or BDR are the druthers. We saw this earlier. A router is a druther. It's neither the DR or the BDR. So they use that multi-access address of 224.006, all of the designated routers, and they send their table updates, their routing table updates, to the designated router. And by the way, also to the backup designated router, because he's, if he's going to take over any second instantaneously, he has to be just as updated as the designated router is. So they both listen to all updates. So we have like, it's like a raid driver race. We have router raid. We have two routers, one ready to take over in case the other one fails. So in this case, we have three routers connected to each other. Ethernet multi-access network, 192.168.1.network slash 24. So OSPF has automatically elected a designated router. And in this case, we did not bother to go in and create any loopback ports. We did not bother to go in and create um, Oh yeah, I'm sorry. He has he has created the router ID. Um, he has created the router ID of 1.1.1.1 with the router priority command, and router two is 2.2.2.2 from the previous suggestion, and router three is 3.3.3.3. Well, three is higher than all the other numbers, so three becomes a designated router. The next the tiebreaker, the 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 second place winner, 2.2.2.3, he becomes a backup designated router. So in this way, I can control by using the router ID value, which one I wish to do. If I don't want to be an accident of whatever IP addresses happen to exist on that particular one, I can control this. We can look at these by looking at the command show IP OSPF. Interface gigabit 000, we saw this command earlier. And we can see that um, the interface is a, a this state is a drug for this machine. And he also tells us which one of his neighbors is the designated router and which one is the backup designated router. So we're looking at the print from R1 in that previous print. R1 was not the designated router or the backup designated router. R2 and 3 were. So when we tell R1, ask R1, what's, what's the state of view? He says, well, I'm neither the backup designated router or designated router. I'm just a router myself. So this is a show command to verify what's going on. So well, let's look at R2. R2, we look at this state. R2, well, R2 is telling us, well, I'm a backup designated router. And I'm adjacent with a neighbor who is not another designated router, but my neighbor whose ID is 3333. That's a designated router. So this command show IP OSPF interface is very valuable because it tells you what you state this router R2 is in and where are the backup and designated routers and designated routers in this particular network. Now let's look at R3. Remember R3 was the designated router? State, designated router. Tells us which one is the designated router and backup designated router. And he's adjacent with this backup and he's adjacent with another router, just a router. It's just, he's a peon, he's not a designated router, backup designated router. We can also look at show IP OSPF neighbor command to see what our neighbor's states are. So if it's a full druther state, that's a router that's not a designated router, backup designated router. So they're, they're in the full state. They've they're gone through the process of IDing each other with hello packets. They're updating their database tables with each other, and they're staying in sync. Full DR means that the adjacent router is the designated router state. Full BDR means the, des the, the adjacent router is a backup designated router. And two-way druther is a neighbor relationship between a non-designated router, a, back, a router that is not neither designated or backup designated router, 
<coughs> he still has neighbor relationships with other matters. They still exchange hello packets for him. So normally, it's going to be the full state. If they're stuck in some other state, there's some problem with forming adjacencies. Maybe the subnet mass don't match or some other problem exists. Area numbers are wrong, something of that nature. So the only exception is if I have three or four or more routers in the multi-access broadcast network, there's going to be one DR, there's going to be one BDR, but the relationship between those other two routers, which are druthers, they'll be in the two-way state with each other. They'll only be in the full state with the designated router, a backup designated router. That's normal operation. So he's typed on router two, show IP OSPF neighbor. And OSPF2 was the one at the top of the triangle. To the left was R1, which was a druther, a non-DR, non-BDR. To the right was the designated router. And so we can see the neighbor IDs, their router IDs, and the state to be sent. And he should be in a full state. Uh, since he's a, he's a backup designated router, he's going to be in the full state with all the other routers. <clears throat> So let's go through the selection process once more. It's going to be based upon the highest interface priority. I have typed the interface command and made it a low a number. The sec uh, made it, make it a high number. The router with the highest interface priority number is going to be the designated router. The router with the second highest number will become the backup designated router. Now, if I set an interface priority value to zero, that router cannot be elected as a designated or backup designated router. So if the interface priorities are equal, then the router with the highest router ID will become the designated router, and the second one will become the backup designated router. And this takes place as soon as the first router with an interface becomes active on the network. So if all the routers haven't finished booting yet, it's possible that a router that you intended to become the BR or DR won't become that. And if I just add a new router, that doesn't take a new election process. <coughs> But what I can do is, well, in extreme case, I can do a copy run start and reload all the routers, and they'll probably be okay. Or I can uh, I can shut down uh, all the interface ports, no shut uh, shutdown, that connect them to each other, and then start the one I I want to become the Disney router, start them up first. The one I want to become the backup Disney router, start them up second, just to make sure that the third router doesn't boot faster and, and cheat the first ones out because he booted that more quickly. Maybe it's a different router type that boots faster. Okay, what happens if the designated router fails? Okay, in a RAID drive array, if one of the drives fails, we continue using it the drives. In a des if a designated router fails, but the pro OSPF process stops, or if maybe the wire comes loose from the gigabit port, someone shuts it down, he can't be the DR anymore. Within one second, the backup designated router will automatically promote himself to DR. Doesn't matter what they, if other priorities have come into existence that, that should supersede him. The election has already taken place. So after a backup designated router is promoted to a designated router, a new backup designated router election will occur and will select a new backup designated router, according to the state at that moment at the first one fails. Yeah, nothing confusing about that technology. Okay, if the interface priorities are equal, by default, they're all equal. The router with their highest router ID will be elected the DR. So I can use elect interface priorities instead. So if a router is, uh, remember that router that was in between area zero and area 51? He was in two networks. He was in two areas. I can allow a router to be a designated router in one network and a backup designated router in the other. This is similar to the scheme we use with our VLANs and our, our um, uh, STP on the different VLANs. We made the first switch, uh, we made it the root bridge for VLANs 10 and 20, and the second switch, we made it the VLANs for 20, 30, and 40 to spread the load out, load balance. So you can do this. You can load balance out the backup designated router and designated router duties on a complex network where there's more than one multi-access network. So if, again, if I set the value to zero, it means he cannot become a DR or BDR on that network. 1 to 255, with the highest number being the winner. So how do we configure this? 
I'm going to go to R1 and I'm going to say interface gigabit 000. Changes to prompt changes to config dash IF. And I'll say IP OSPF priority 255, the highest possible priority. Then I'll type end. And then if I want to reset the ISPF process on this particular router, since I changed the priority value, I'm going to type clear IP OSPF process. And he'll prompt me, really, you really want to do this? Say yes. And it'll go through the process again. I'm going to the down state, the init state, the two-way state, uh, and go back uh, to the full state eventually. Okay, by default, look at this. Look at this cost metric, and let's talk about metric for a second. Um, in RIP, the metric was hop count. So if a router was three hops away, the metric was three hops. Not a measurement of bandwidth whatsoever. It's a measurement of how many routers there were. But, oh, uh, RIP is brain dead. He doesn't understand bandwidth. He'll choose the one hop over the three hop, even if the one hop method is a 56 kilobit dial up modem and the three hop method is 10 gigabit ethernet. He has no concept in his mind of bandwidth. He's a moron studying to be an idiot. He's a very primitive routing protocol. But modern routing protocols like OSPF and EIGRP generally will dynamically calculate the best route depending on which one is the fastest. They're exactly similar to the way cost is determined in the spanning tree protocol for bridges and uh, switches. So we have to make this metric be a number that as the bandwidth gets bigger and faster, we have to put it at the bottom of the fraction and make the fraction get smaller as the bandwidth gets faster. So we take a reference value of 100,000, 100 million, and we divide that by the actual interface. So that means if I have a, you know, a one, uh, a one gigabyte ISP connection and a 10 gigabyte ethernet connection, then when I put them in the bottom of the fraction, the 10 gigabyte ethernet fraction will become the smaller value because the bottom of the fraction is bigger. Because one quarter is smaller than one half. Four is bigger than two but it becomes a smaller number when I put it in the bottom part of the fraction. If you want to adjust this manually, you can use the IP OSPF cost or reference bandwidth command on interfaces that need us to change this default method of calculating it, because some methods now are quicker. <clears throat> so using the old method, um, fast ethernet, gigabit ethernet, 10 gigabit ethernet would calculate the same cost. Oh dear, that's gonna give us uh, improper results. So we can go there and we can manually, if we got super fast network, we can change that value. So let's adjust the reference bandwidth. Let's take this cost of, of 100 million divided by 1 billion. Well, it becomes 0 0.1, but it's rounded up to one. So it's equivalent to fast ethernet. So we don't want them to all be fast ethernet. So, so 20th century now. So let's change the reference bandwidth to a more common value for today's networks. And we'll use the auto cost reference bandwidth command. Make it a thousand gigabit Ethernet. Make it ten thousand, ten gig Ethernet. Okay, we're a modern uh, uh, place here in San Francisco. Let's make it a hundred gig Ethernet. They're shipping hundred gig Ethernet now. Make it bandwidth a hundred thousand. And you can always return it to the to the other to the reference if you want to. Or we can change the cost on one specific interface using IP OSPF cost command. So if I type the command show IP OSPF interface, that'll show me the current cost assigned to it. And if I've got super fast links, I can change this. So it's accumulated cost. So let's assume that our reference bandwidth is, is 10 gig here, configured on all three routers, because we got one gig and 10 gig interfaces these days. So the loopback interfaces always have a default cost of one. Every, all, all the time, it's always one. And the cost of links between each router is now 10. So as the router R1 figure, Look at R1, my pencil here. R1, what's the best cost, lowest cost method to get to R3? Well, if I go this way, the total cost is 10. If I go through the other router, it's 10 plus 10 is 20. <clears throat> so that's the lowest cost. That's how he figures the best method with the fastest bandwidth between one point and another point. I can type show IP route on the router. And of course, I'll see this cost when you type show IP route, you see in the parentheses, you see the number that's the administrative distance, 110, this is the default administrative distance for OSPF, slash, and then they show the cost, this fractional decimal value they come up with by distilling the, you know, the actual bandwidth and putting it in the bottom of the fraction so that it gets uh, smaller as the bandwidth gets faster. 
So here's our routing table. And we can see that the default administrative cost, administrative distance, trustworthiness, reliability, Boy Scout motto, how wonderful is the routing protocol? Well, 110 is uh, uh, a little bit better than RIP. RIP's 120, OSPF is 110, EIGRP is 90 because that's Cisco proprietary, and the cost is 11. Remember, 10 plus 1, 11. So that's the best path back to that one particular network. And this router knows where to send its packets. I can manually do the cost value myself. I can go to interface G00 and say IP cost 30. Just manually determine the number myself. And they'll patch it right into the table. That interface loopback port, I can manually make it 10 instead of the default of 1. Uh, this is useful when you have a mixture of different vendors' products, and they might not be totally consistent with each other. You can fix problems in this fashion. Maybe I'm using, it's, it's kind of unusual. Most companies will use all Cisco routers and switches or they'll use some other manufacturers, routers and switches. <clears throat> Tarrant Tar County College is all Cisco shop. We all use Cisco routers and switches. But if maybe you're a big company like Cisco, you bought another company and they were using some other brand, we could use this as a temporary fixed connectivity to their network until we get them to get them on the plan and drink the Cisco Kool-Aid. Okay, now let's have a back failover to a backup route. If the route link between R1 and R2 goes down, that's that link between the bottom left and the upper top of the triangle. I could simulate that. I could go to the gigabit port and just shut it down. Now there's another way of getting to that other router, but it's through, uh, through a, a different connection. It has no direct connection now, and that's got to go hop by hop through two routers to get there. So the cost has increased slightly, but he still does connectivity. Okay, how, how often are these hello packets sent out? In a multi-access network, every 10 seconds. Now, remember if I did that passive interface command on that ethernet port that went out to my call center employees, there's no further routers in that direction. There's no need to send router update information out that link because there's no routers that way. It's just employee PCs. So every 10 seconds on all the enabled interfaces, uh, the dead interval is the period by which the router waits to declare that link dead. So I'm supposed to hear a hello from you every 10 seconds. I'm R1, and I've been hearing the hellos from R2 every 10 seconds. And the 10 seconds goes by, and R2 is silent. I don't hear him anymore. What happened? I'll wait 20 seconds. Still nothing. I'm getting worried. 30 seconds. Something is dreadfully wrong between R1 and R2. 40 seconds. The dead interval has elapsed. Any access I ha had to R2's networks, I now say, I rip them out of my topology table, I take them out of my routing network and reconverge and recalculate. So the default with Cisco is four times at the hello interval. 10 seconds for hello, 40 seconds for dead. This hello and dead interval must match between networks or they will not form an adjacency with each other. So unless you have a good reason to tamper with these values, uh, don't change them. <clears throat> Let's verify these intervals. I'm going to type show IP OSPF interface and look, timer intervals, hello, 10, dead, 40. I can verify this. So I can check, like Reagan said, trust, but verify. I can also type show IPS, show IP OSPF interface, and I can see these timers counting down. So here's the, my neighbor router 3333. The dead timer is counted down to 35 seconds. It should never go below 30. Because every 10 seconds, it should go back up to 40 again and start counting down for 40. The other router, he's one second away from another update. Now, if these numbers start climbing down towards zero, I've lost communication with that adjacent router. And when it gets down 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0, uh-oh, I've lost the adjacency. Take him out of the network until he comes back up. Maybe the phone line went down. Maybe he'll come back eventually. But I'm not going to trust him anymore after the dead timer has expired. Now, we can change these intervals if we want to better have a good reason for doing this. Uh, CCNA guys, you have no good reason for doing this. You must be CCMP or CCIE to have a good reason for messing with these intervals. If I change them and I don't go to each and every one of the 300 routers in my company and make them match, I will destroy my network connectivity within my, within my enterprise. I don't want that to take place. So if you want to 
if you've made IP OSPF hello interval some crazy number and you want to change it back because you've ruined the connectivity, just go back to no IP OSPF interval. I'll go back to the default. That'll fix it for you. Now, in this case, we changed the interval from 10 to 5 and dead from 40 to 20. And look what happened. We lost our adjacency. Why did we lose our adjacency with our network, with our adjacent neighbor? Because his timers are still 10 and 40. I'll have to go and change him before they'll come back up and establish a neighborship with each other again and get back in communication. So that's why you must be very cautious about changing these values. Okay, let's talk about default route propagation. This is this default route, IP route 0000, 0000, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, and then we point to an interface or an IP next hop address to our internet service provider or maybe our home office so that we don't have to have thousands or millions of routes in our little bitty branch office router, which is only $1,000 and doesn't have the capability for handling that. So what we can do is establish a default route. In that diagram we had at the beginning, it was the router at the top was connected to the cloud, to the internet service provider. On that router, the one at the top, we're going to establish a default route pointing to not loopback one, but the IP address of the ISP that is assigned to us. So everybody that's connected, directly connected to that router, they're in good shape. They'll have direct connectivity to the internet. But what about the routers at the bottom? R1 and R3 don't have any default route established. And I just could go to R1 and R3 and repeat the IP route command and establish the next hop. But what, well, three routers, that's not so hard. What if I have 300 routers? Want to do it 299 more times? Or would you simply rather enter one line on the top router and one additional line on that top router? Now, we're running an OSPF routing process anyway, ain't we? And it's propagating route information anyway, isn't it? We can also, we just told it to propagate that default route from R2, the top router, to all the other routers in our enterprise. It could be hundreds of them. And that way, one router, the one that's closely connected, our gateway router to our service provider, then everybody has access to him. Let's verify this. So on the one router that we actually configured this on, R2 was the one that actually was connected to our service provider. And we see that the default static route is shown in the table as S for static. And the asterisk, the star, means this is the default candidate default route. And the line here says gateway of last resort is, and it's been set. I don't know where that line came from. I don't want that. And then when we look at the other router, R1, it says, yes, I know about the default route I heard about from OSPF2. It's an OSO for OSPF star, default candidate route. It's technically, it's an OSPF type 2, e, type two external route. It's how, remember all the 715 type routes we had back at the beginning of the first chapter? That's how it shows up in the routing table. So in the main routing table, it's going to show up as a star, just like you would expect. And all the ones it's propagated to, it'll show up as this. This is proper normal operation. OK, let's look at OSPF neighbors. Um, I'm going to type show IP interface brief and make sure that on each one of those two routers that we're going to do in the lab, that all the interfaces are up. They have correct IP addresses. I didn't fat finger like 129 instead of 192. Make sure I didn't forget to type no shutdown. I can type show IP route, make sure that the routing table has all the expected routes from its directly connected networks. And then I can type show IP OSPF neighbor to see if I have an adjacency, a neighborship with my root with my neighbors, I should be able to talk to them. I can type show IP protocols to see that it's running the OSPF process and they're both, you know, error zero. I can type show IP OSPF interface, and that gives me very valuable information as to if it's a multi-access network and you want designated routers and backup designated routers, which particular router is the designated router? Which particular one is the backup designated router? Even if it's not me or just me, I want to know. And that's a good command that'll tell you that. So show IP OSPF neighbor shows me my neighbors, shows me that dead time, which never should go below 30 on a normal default value, 40 seconds being dead. So if they're not in the full state, the routers are not fully adjacent yet. Now, if it's a network that doesn't, that has more than, has four or more networks, two will be the backup and designated, designated router, backup designated router. The other routers will all be a full state with the DR, BDR, but they'll be only in the two-way state with each other. And that's normal if you have many routers in one multi-access network. 
So what can we do wrong that could prevent two routers from forming an adjacency? We're just doing two routers in our lab on Thursday. What could possibly cause the problem to take? Well, the subnet masks don't match. Oh, well, they're not on the same network. Can't ping. If they can't ping, they can't. Hello. The hello and dead timers must match exactly. We'll leave them at the default. They'll match. The network types do not match. Well, they got both got to be point to point, or they both got to be broadcast, or whatever. They got to be the same, or they won't match. By default, they'll be broadcast and they'll match. You're going to change them to point to point in the lab. If there's a missing or incorrect OSPF network command, if I haven't specified the particular interface to receive and send updates through and be advertised to all the other routers, he won't be in there. So that can that can hose it for me. So, okay, in this slide, we have typed show IP protocols, and we quickly want to see what routing protocols are running on this router. Well, OSPF, process number 10, could be any number. I like to use one. Shows us the router ID for this particular router. Shows us that on this router, we have told these ports, the two gigabit ports and the loopback port, to participate in the area zero routing for OSPF. And then we hear our other routers that are present that we're adjacent with. Show IP OSPF itself will show us, oh, we're OSPF 10. My ID for R1 is 1.1.1.1. We're in the backbone area, area zero. And the shortest path first algorithm has run four times. So that tells me a little bit how long this router's been on because it does it when you first turn on the router and then it does again every 30 minutes. So this must be sometime between one and a half and two hours after the routers came on because he's done the SPF algorithm an additional three times beyond the initial one. And that's every 30 minutes. Show IP OSPF interface shows me, is there DR and BDR? Well, that's good, but we know we designated this router in the lab. We're gonna call it a point-to-point -point router. So there's no DR and BDR in a point-to-point -point network because in the point-to-point -point network, there's only two routers, R1 and R2 maybe. Neighbor count, one neighbor. I'm adjusting one there. I'm one, 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 one. He's two, 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 two. Now I can type show IP OSPF interface brief. And this is a real good command for seeing all my interfaces on this router that are a part of the OSPF process. What's the IP address and the mask of all the uh, networks that are being advertised? What's the cost? It shows the cost here. What's the network state? and whether the number of neighbors on each link. Oh, that's it, that's it, that's it. Okay, so I have, I'm pretty sure I turned on the chapter exam, the module exam for these first two chapters. The first one covers chapters one and two OSP. So there's no particular deadline you'll have to do by tomorrow. It's just that all work in this class is due by the last day of the final exam, which is Wednesday, May the 12th, something like that is the final 9 a.m. in the morning. It's the final time for turning in all work. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go on mute and hang loose for a couple seconds in case anybody's got any chat questions they want to post in here. And uh, first of all, hold on, hold on, let me stop recording.